Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Say hello, Jack. 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 He's being shy. Um, I just had uh, the opportunity of doing a great interview with Jesus Garcia, and it's on the residential school system story in Canada. You're probably aware of the whole claim of the mass graves and all those kinds of things. Anyway, we thought we'd tell the other side of the story because the story you've heard from the media is just simply not true, or at least it's not complete. Of course, human history is messy, and uh, the contact between European people and uh, Aboriginal peoples has not always been perfect. Of course it hasn't. The contact between European people and other European people hasn't been perfect, so why would we expect anything else? But um, in any case, what you've been told by the media isn't just off base or a little bit out there. It's basically completely wrong. So at the beginning of this interview, I'm urging you to sit through about five minutes. I found an old documentary showing firsthand what actually happened at the residential schools. And this was made by the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, back before it was the Communist Broadcasting Corporation. And what's interesting is that this delightful documentary showing the sort of other side of the story was actually filmed at the Kamloops Residential School, which is where the whole mass grave hoax, is what it was, started. So enjoy the show. remember when you are um, using the telephone, thinking along the courtesy line, Arnold? Do you know what the verse it says? If you wish to be happy all the day, make someone else happy. That is the way. Don't put your hands by your face, will you? Put your hands. Let me see how many can put your hands right on their desk nicely. That's nice. That looks better that way. Very. Is everyone ready now to hear a nice story about Christmas? Because very, very soon now, it's going to be Christmas. And we want to get all ready for Christmas, don't we? And you know what? It's going to be somebody's birthday Christmas time. It's going to be the birthday of Jesus, that's right. And we want to be ready, and we want to have presents for him, don't we? So we want to give him presents of kindness and little sacrifices that we make sometimes and buy a little present and give it to somebody that's poor, yeah. So we're going to go over our little recitation that tells us about Christmas. Would you stand up now nicely? That's good. I'm going to save a little recitation. Long, long ago. See there, no way. Eh? You see anything you want to buy? Eh? Anything there you want to buy? Eh? Why? Oh, come on, you don't see anything there. Come on, come on. You're not going to buy anything. <laughs> Father, why? 
parents and God bless you. My good Jesus, I thank thee with all my heart. How good, how kind thou art to me, sweet Jesus. The parents wanted their children to be sent to the residential school because the quality and the conditions were better than just going to the day school. And we have the records of many instances when the, the chief of the council, the Indian council, they were requesting the government to provide the, to build the schools and specifically at times Catholic schools to provide for the, for the education of the children. That is the truth. And, um, um, and if somebody doesn't want to, to know about that, that well, that's, uh, there's nothing we can do about it, but the records are there. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Um, a special privilege I have today, I'm speaking to Jesus Garcia, and um, he is a Spanish linguistic extraordinaire and he lives in winnipeg perhaps the coldest well maybe the coldest city in let's call it civilized canada there are some colder ones in nunavut and places like that but nobody lives there um maybe we'll ask him this interview how he goes from having a wonderful mediterranean existence to ending up in winter peg but um he's an award-winning and noted educator he's been heralded by the winnipeg uh, Pre- F- winnipeg free press as an internationally recognized premier linguistic instructor He's a leading Spanish language specialist in Winnipeg, an ambassador of the Spanish language in Canada, and an excellent organization that he runs. Um, He was a languages manager at the Open University in the United Kingdom. He taught for over 20 years at Newcastle University, Sunderland University, Northumbria University, and also Canadian universities. Uh, Jesus Garcia graduated with first-class honors in education, finishing first in his university. Really good. He went on to study linguistics and literature at uh, Valladolid University in Spain. After being awarded the prestigious Erasmus Scholarship from the European Union, he continued his studies at Newcastle University. He has a master's degree in teaching and a master's in knowledge and information society. Uh, He then went on to do his PhD in knowledge management. And uh, there's more to his biography, including interviews with the CBC, which used to be called the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. I think the C might stand for communism now. Um... And uh, he's a faithful Catholic, and he's reached out to me, and we're going to talk today about the history, the real history of residential schools in Canada. Jesus, thanks for joining me. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So that's a pretty extensive biography. So before we get into the topic, why don't you give us a little background on how you go from Spain to one of the coldest cities in the free world? Well, uh, I was born and I'm brought up in Burgos in Spain, and I started my university studies there, and then I ended up in Newcastle in the northeast of England, and I was studying first and then teaching for several years um, Newcastle University, and that's where I met my wife, who is from Winnipeg. So we came, <laughs> well, 20 years ago, 20 winters ago to, to, to Winnipeg, and since then we have lived here. 
So have you become a, a Winnipeg Jets or Blue Bombers fan since you've been there? No, not yet. Not yet. Okay. In time, in time. Um, all right. So um, your background is in linguistics and so forth. I have a, a Spanish degree from University of Ottawa. And, um, and, but we're going to talk today about the residential schools. Now, uh, I've written about this extensively, both for LifeSite News and for Crisis Magazine. I've talked about it on my channel here. Uh, pretty much everybody of good sense who is willing to think for themselves, uh, generally conservative, let's say, pretty much everybody is okay with admitting that there were no mass graves. There was none of, there was none of this narrative that was put forth of, you know, nuns chucking children into big holes in the ground like it was Auschwitz, like people literally had this conception. That's obviously false. Mainstream news, CTV even had to reluctantly admit that what they reported was false. Um, or they wouldn't admit it, but they, you know, you know what I'm saying. They did it in their jujitsu, media jujitsu way. Um, but most Canadians, even conservative and religious, most Canadians still believe the residential schools were black and white, a terrible, awful institution where the Catholic Church sent in special forces agent to take children from their homes and cut their hair off and hit them with sticks and, you know, you know, tell them never to be native again or something. There's this view that it was just this worst, most awful, disgusting black stand in Canadian history. But in some cases, the complete opposite. It's at least more complicated than that. Perhaps we could do a little background on the whole residential school history in general. Well, the, the idea of having a public school system and a free public school system um, run by the state goes back in Europe and in Canada uh, to the 19th century. So it was in the 19th century when politicians, also churchmen and educators, debated these questions of the educational fun financing, how to finance the schools and how to participate in the, in the school system. So there was um, somebody from Canada uh, in the mid 19th century went to, to Europe, visited 20 countries between 1844 and 1845, and then he developed um, a proposal for a public school system. So before that, the education was in the hands of uh, the church um, and also families. And if you live lived in the countryside, it was left either a private, a private tutor, a priest, or some nuns. I'm talking about uh, specifically about Canada, uh, very much the same also in Europe. And then uh, in Canada in 1867, there was this uh, important piece of legislation called the Constitution Act. And then the federal government said that the education was the responsibility of the different provinces. And, and that was in, um, in the year 1871, Ontario, the province of Ontario instituted for the very first time, the first free state-run school. And then the rest of the, of the provinces in Canada follow suit. Um, obviously, a lot of families uh, didn't send the children uh, the children to, to school because the, the the children providing labor, and obviously labor contributed to the family survival. So many parents were reluctant to send the, the children to school. And even though uh, officially the the legal documents made compulsory the education compulsory the basic education up to certain age, as I said, many families couldn't couldn't afford to, to send the children to, to school. Now, the residential schools more or less uh, come from that uh, piece of legislation. And it was in, in the year 1876, the Indian Act uh, was passed. And that's where the, the, the piece of legislation that the federal government established the relationships with all the Aboriginal tribes or indigenous or First Nations, uh, whatever you want to call them. And that's when they established the, um, the residential schools. And then the curriculum in the res these residential indigenous schools, the Indian schools, um, took place. Um, and actually, in, when the, the different provinces signed agreements between the Indian tribes and the federal government, and in one of the sections, they established that the federal government will build these schools as long as the, the Indian chiefs and the councils of the Indians ask for it. So that's the background. And when you look at the curriculum of the residential schools, it very, was very much the same as the public school system. So was it compulsory education? Uh, yes, because it was compulsory education for everybody uh, up to 
uh, up to a certain point because there were some exceptions, right? For example, the government said, if you have to have the children to work on your land, then you are excused, so if it's too far. So there were certain exceptions, but it, it was compulsory education like today. Education is also compulsory for, for everybody. Now, how many schools were there um, in terms of residential Indian schools specifically? Well, the Canadian Encyclopedia says that over 130 residential schools operated between the year 1831 and the year 1996. So in total, we're talking about 165 years. Uh, and then uh, something, to, uh, an important date to, to take into account is in the year 1969, that's when the Canadian government took over responsibility for the remaining residential schools for, from the churches. And then by 1979, still 28 residential schools, residential Indian schools remain. So thousands of indigenous students were enrolled at the 28 residential schools that were running in Canada at that time. So that that's is this, this is the background more or less. Does it make sense? Any questions so far? Yeah. So so this is okay. There's some important details here. For one, education in in Canada is compulsory for everybody, to a degree to, with exceptions. We homeschool our children, um, so we're just required. If no one's asked, please don't ask government. Uh, but um, we're in Ontario. You don't have to provide anything unless they ask you to, and it's it's very you know, rubber stamped, just show us you're doing a curriculum. That's about it. Um, it's common in the history with farmers and their kids would be out of school. That's where our actual summer breaks, generally speaking, come from is to fit the farm schedule um, because they won't be there when there's harvest anyway. Um, and another important thing, so I should add there, in, in Canada today, if you cannot demonstrate that you're providing an education for your kids, the government will force your kids to go to school. That's the way it works. I'm not, I'm not even saying that's good. I'm not like everyone knows me. I think if there's more than two or three people, the government's probably too big. Okay. I'm very limited government just in my temperament. I get that. But as the law stands, if you cannot show that you're doing something, some homeschool curriculum, some distance program, whatever, you must you will have your, basically child services will probably come and physically take your children to school. It'd be a whole mess if it happened, okay? So that is just the law in Canada. That's very important for people to remember. This is not about natives. It's not about uh, Europeans or whatever. It's just the law in Canada. Also, uh, you mentioned the Canadian Encyclopedia talks about residential schools being in, in, in um, service from 1835 to 1996 or whatever. Well, this number has to have context as well. Canada was not officially Canada till 1867. Now, obviously, we love to say we were Canada in 1812 because that's when we beat the Americans. Um, but officially, these pieces of legislation is about residential schools, qua residential schools. This cannot be in force in the way that it's, the narrative says before the legislation's in force. So if there are residential schools in 1835 and beyond or, and, and after that, these are regional programs with the various uh, provinces, with, with provinces within British North America, wherein they have their compulsory school guidelines, which can include certain schools run by various churches. And then also into the 1990s, people have this idea that in like 1990, like I saw Justin Trudeau's tweet, you know, we're so sorry for being the most evil country in human history, blah, 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 blah. And, um, you know, the schools were enforced in 1996. Well, you can go look at the places. They exist. They're in like towns. You can look them up on Google Maps. They were public schools. Like these were just basically schools where students went to school during the day and they were either near a reserve or on a reserve or something like that. And they would go to school. So even this word residential school is misused. The history is not understood. And last thing I'll say here, maybe you can elaborate on this. They were, the, the government said they would build the schools as long as who the tribes and the chiefs wanted them. That's right. So this is not just something imposed from the top. This is, Hey, we like being in Canada. We're Chippewa, whatever tribe we are. I think it's probably a good thing if our kids can read and write. That's probably good for all of us. If you would build us a school, we'd be happy to send them. That seems to be more accurate. Right. And then there were something to take into account. There were three types of schools uh, for Indians, uh, aboriginals. There were the residential schools, uh, boarding, boarding schools, 
because even in the in other countries you still have boarding schools. Um, where I grew up in Burgos, there was also a boarding school uh, under the species of the Jesuits uh, for people who were living in the province. And then the while they were studying, the, the meals were provided and then the, the accommodation was provided. So that's the residential boarding school. Then there was also the industrial school for, for indigenous so that they could learn trades. And it happened in other countries. For example, in Ireland, I'm going to mention something in comparison to Ireland, they provided uh, the same uh, industrial schools where the children um, and teenagers could learn a trade. And then there was also a different, a third type of a school. It was the day school, which meant that in this case, uh, indigenous Indian uh, pupils could attend school just like in the public school system during the day. And then they will go back uh, to their house, to the parents' home uh, in the evening. Um, a very good source of information is uh, for anybody who wants in to, look into, to, to look into this and to access thousands of records provided by by the state, by the provinces and by the different religious organizations and institutes is the Library, Library and Archives Canada. Uh, they have a very good website and you can find thousands of records, uh, reports from the physicians, from principals, um, from the Indian agents. And according to Library and Archives Canada, website they, they say that there were 140 residential schools in total 140 residential schools in basically 150 years give or take uh, in canada now out of all those residential schools for for indians uh, how many were run by the catholic church or different catholic organizations or religious orders there were 65 of them they were considered roman catholic which is 46 percent in total of all the residential schools 32 were run by the Anglicans, 22 were non-denominational according to the Library Archives Canada, 10 Presbyterian and 7 Methodists. And a few years ago there was a commission established by the federal government known as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And then they interviewed lots of people for many years and then they came up with some reports. And the uh, the volume, the book that I'm more interested in is the one dealing with the deaths and burials of pupils from the residential Indian schools. And it's the volume number four. It's, you can access it on the internet, it's free access. And there are only uh, 153 pages without notes and bibliography, without taking into account the notes and bibliography. So in 153 pages, they report about the, the deaths, the cost of deaths, and the type of burials of these students. And we can talk about this specifically. And then this report, book number four, volume number four, they uh, quote considerably from official files from physicians, principals, governmental agents of the Department of Indian Affairs, official correspondence, inspector reports. And also uh, we have the correspondence from principals to the government department requesting funds. We even have the receipts from the 19th, uh, turn of the 20th century of the money that they had to ask from the federal government because everything had to be documented. And we have, fortunately, we have access to that online. So that's the main source of information, the Library Archives uh, Canada. And then there is also, you have the archives of the different religious sources open to the public. And also there's another one, uh, is right now at the University of Manitoba, is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the um, um, and then you have access to, to those uh, public funds uh, online. So the report, the Truth and Reconciliation Com uh, Commission report, confirms that residential school cemeteries were used not only to bury students, but also to bury members of the religious community, even bishops in one of them, and also members of the community. So when we talk about, for example, the, the cemeteries in some of these um, reserves, Indian reserves, where the, the schools took place and the residential schools took place. And lots of the, the burials, you are going to find not only uh, students who died, and we're going to look at the diseases, why, uh, the, the cause of the, the death, but also members of the staff, religious priests, um, religious sisters, and even members, other Indians from the community. Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, the newspaper from Canada called The Star, 
on June the 1st, 2021, mentions St. Mary's Residential School in Mission, British Columbia. And they quote partly a text about the cemetery, and I quote, although the cemetery belongs to the Oblate Fathers, it has served the burial needs of the fathers, the pioneer families of the area, and many First Nations families. A walk through this lovely cemetery is like a walk through history with the names of bishops, priests, First Nations people, and pioneers all sharing the same resting place. End of quote. So you so can see that it was sorry. Was that one of the locate? That wasn't one of the locations where they said there was unmarked graves, was it? Mission DC. Yes, that was uh, in Kamloops. It was specifically Kamloops. That was Kamloops. Yeah, uh, Kamloops. Uh, and actually, uh, about two years ago, uh, the the tribe from Kamloops issued a press release that um, galvanized the interest of uh, lots of people here in Canada. Because allegedly they said that following some ground penetrating radar investigation, they have discovered uh, some disturbances. They didn't call it disturbances of, of around 200 and something uh, places in the, well, from the cemetery or burial, burial site. I wrote to them. I wrote to the, specifically to the, to the tribe uh, asking, and I said, well, I'm a researcher from the University of Manitoba and I'm in investigating and researching this specifically uh, area, may I have access to the uh, ground penetrating radar report? Um, and then they say, no, they're the chief of the tribe. <laughs> they, they denied access to that, even though it was provided with public funds. And what is interesting, Kennedy, is that no other journalist no, has ever asked for, can I have a copy of the ground penetrating radar? That's also very important because uh, according to some research, uh, scientific research uh, conducted uh, a few years ago about the capabilities of the ground penetrating radar using different megahertz, after so many months, it's almost impossible to figure out if uh, there is a body in, um, in, in the ground. They can, the, the technology can detect some disturbance in the ground, but it's impossible to realize whether there is a, a body or even less if it's the body of an adult or a child. Um, so that was very, very interesting. So let's, that's, okay, so let's put this in perspective. So in Mission BC, where one of these cemeteries is, what there was a residential school at some point. And again, if there's Americans watching, it just means boarding school. I almost think somehow the word residential school has become like a, almost like a, 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 san a sanitary term or something. It's like referring to, I don't know. It's just, it seems like a, it's, if you say boarding school, everyone knows what you mean by that. Oh, a boarding school. Everyone's gone to boarding school, something historically. Um, you know, whereas residential schools, ooh, residential, it sounds very, anyway. So, but when Justin Trudeau took that silly picture where he was kneeling beside like a pink or orange landscaping flag with a teddy bear in hand at what, it was either, he was either kneeling at tree roots or rocks that were found by some ground penetrating radar, or if it was one of the cemeteries where the crosses had not been um, replaced, which was not the fault of the church, by the way, because they don't own the property anymore. Um, he may he may have been kneeling at the grave of a bishop. How funny is that? Justin Trudeau may have been kneeling beside the grave of a you know a French Canadian woman who who died 150 years ago. He may have been kneeling beside the coffin of a little native child who sadly died of tuberculosis during a, uh, an epidemic. He may have been kneeling um, uh, at a bunch of tree roots and, and, and soil deposits. And uh, all of those could have been true. This is how absurd this thing became. Well, the, the thing is when these um, schools were established, um, even all the angels, the, the federal agents, when they, they, they were constant visits from the physicians, um, school inspectors and people working on the land, um, surveying the land and the surveyors, you, you have access to the actual maps online uh, when the, the surveyors, the, the document where the churches, with the school is, um, and even the cemeteries. In most places, it's clearly documented where the, the burial places were established. And we have pictures, many, many pictures. If you look at, for example, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation website, which is now 
established in the, at the University of Manitoba, you have access to uh, thousands of pictures provided by um, the Anglican Church, the Catholic Church, the different religious orders, and also federal government, um, governmental documents and pictures documenting and at times the, the burial. Um, I can mention that specifically there are pictures of the children praying for All, for all Souls Day in front of the, the tombs of other students. And even the, the religious sisters, they, they documented in the diaries, in the archives, that there were Indians helping to clear the cemetery and the burial grounds to prepare uh, well, the, the, the burials. So it's documented, nothing, nothing mysterious about it. Usually in, in these big uh, reserves, Indian reserves, well, you are going to be buried where, when you were born, when you went to church, when you were baptized, you got married. And many of uh, the students who, well, after they left the school, they were buried in those cemeteries. It's documented. And I'll give you an example of that. The National Center for Truth and Reconciliation shows the names of 51 students and the date of their death. And as beautifully recorded by the school in official files. And they die while enrolled at St. Eugene or Eugene Mission School in Kamloops. And the oldest in that register, so out of the 51 students who are documented to be, who have died while they were students or after they, they left the school, they were buried in uh, the first, the oldest one was buried in 1900 and the last one in 1971. And, and I quote, other member bands of the Tunaha Nation, neighboring First Nations communities and the community were buried within the cemetery grounds near St. Eugene, or Eugene Mission School. And this is according to the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. So you're not only having uh, people buried who were students or former students of the Canloops, but also other members of the, of the, the first, uh, first Nation. The, and they are buried, according to these official documents, in the cemetery ground. And the, so, the we should, we sh sorry, we should add here, people need to understand, a lot of native Canadians became Catholic because they're human beings and many human beings become Catholic. You know, I'm Italian and uh, English background. Our friend here is Spanish. Um, you know, there are the Catholics in Africa. There are Catholics in Latin America. There are, there are Catholics in the Middle East. There are Catholics in China. Your skin color is irrelevant. People just become Catholic. And when they're Catholic, normally speaking, they're buried at their parish cemetery. And just like uh, today, we've, uh, well, there are the SSPX and things like that does missions around Canada. And, and, and that old model is kind of revived in that sense. But the missionary model is you open a school. The school has a chapel. The chapel expands into a parish. Then there's a cemetery built. This is why when you go to these old boarding school properties all over the world, you will find basically a rectory somewhere where the priests live, maybe a monastery property. You'll find there was an educational institution. You'll find there's a parish chapel and you'll find there's a cemetery. Um, that's you, you go around uh, Ontario, you'll see these little towns where there's a church, a school and a cemetery, a church, a school and a cemetery. And there's built up subdivisions around them now, but the reason is that's how they were. So, um, these are just Catholics who were just, this is the crazy thing is they're just Catholics who happened to be native, who were just buried where the cemetery was, which was also where the school was. This is a, such a foreign concept for people. I think people have the impression because there's cemeteries at these schools that there was some sort of problem with so many kids dying that they needed a cemetery, whereas this is just standard Catholic practice. Well, that's exactly it. And remember that there is also canon law. And even in the old canon law, um, they were very specific about who can be buried in a Catholic cemetery. And even uh, it, the federal government allowed to, the, in this case, the Catholic Church, to have cemeteries so that the Catholics could be buried in those in those cemeteries. So when you look at the canon law, uh, the church not only documents every single uh, death and burial, but they, they follow the very strict um, rules to for the burial, right? And then when uh, uh, something to to say that I think is important to to mention here is not every single Indian is, uh, child went to a residential school. Uh, only small, all things considered, over the hundred and more or less uh, hundred and fifty years, uh, only a, a part of the, the population went to to residential schools. 
Um, many children who were Indians, Aboriginals, didn't go to, didn't have any school, or they went maybe for to a day school for a few years, and then they 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 never uh, they never went to a boarding school as such. And now, in terms of the deaths, because the whole brouhaha um, has taken place because of the number of deaths, um, and I quote the the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report. The report mentions that the commission project was, and I quote, a systematic effort to record and analyze the deaths at the schools and the presence and condition of the students' cemeteries within the regulatory context in which the schools were intended to operate. That's the end of the quote. So uh, what did the research found out from the other data they collected? In more or less 150 years, there were 3,200 deaths were identified. And the cause of death uh, recorded in 51% of the cases, um, they, they were able to record the cause of death. Um, remember that in, 1940, in 1935, the government adopted a policy on how deaths had to be reported and also had to uh, specify the cause of death, the time of the death, uh, everything was, um, they had to fill out the form. But, um, the principal had to write a report, the physician, and the Indian agent uh, representing the federal government had to write reports. Before that, before 1936, the principal had to report to the Indian agent immediately at once the, the death of one of the, of, of any pupil. And the, according to the report from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, they say, and I quote, for the most part, the cemeteries that the commission documented are abandoned, disused, and vulnerable to accidental disturbance. This is relevant because uh, before 1969, which is when the government took over from the Anglican Church, Catholic Church, the running of the uh, of the schools, those cemeteries were uh, were not abandoned. They were being looked after, but then some of the residential schools were taken down, and then basically the cemeteries were abandoned. Um, and you can see the photographs, for example, of uh, this, the state of the cemeteries in the report from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Before that, uh, you could see that in pictures, in black and white pictures from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s and 60s, the burial sites of the, the uh, pupils um, and other, even other either priests or the staff in, the, in those cemeteries. And um, what I can say is, um, that in, in, it was in 1935 that the Department of Indian Affairs adopted the formal policy on how deaths at the schools were to be reported and investigated. And listen to this. Under this policy, the principal of the, the school was to inform the Indian agent of the death of, the, of a student, and the agent was to then convene and chair a three-person board of inquiry. The two other members of the board were to be the principal and the physician who attended the student. And the board was to complete a form provided by Indian Affairs, the Department, the Federal Af uh, Department of Indian Affairs, that requested information on the cause of death, the treatment provided to the child. Even at times in the report, they said the amount, the the dose of the treatment that the the, the child was provided for with, and then if the child was taken to a hospital. Uh, the transportation and then the physician had to report the cause of death, whether the school had been following his instructions and if there was anything else that the school could have done to prevent that death. So it was extremely thorough. And parents were to be notified under this policy, parents uh, of, the, of the Indian student were to be notified of the inquiry and given the right to attend or have a representative attend the inquiry to make a statement. However, an inquiry was not to be delayed for more than 72 hours to accommodate parents. Uh, and the department was not prepared to pay parents' transportation costs to attend the inquiry. And I, this was a quote from the document. Now, there were a number of instances where the commission was able to find a record, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was able to find a record of the death of a student thanks to a church document that had not been recorded in any of the Department of Indian Affairs documents. And that really shows, it speaks volumes on how thorough these religious um, institutes um, were when it came to document the, the, the well-being of the, the students. Now, okay, so, uh, so let's, let's, just, let's add a couple of context. There's a lot of good information there. 
So, uh, first of all, I really wish they had a process this thorough when they were trying to assess COVID deaths. That might have changed those numbers <laughs> by tens of thousands. Uh, but don't worry, YouTube, we're just joking. Um, and it's a very thorough process. And one thing to note, though, is the process is thorough, but the government's not willing to pay the transportation of the parents. Now, uh, this is not the this is not the church is not willing to do this. This is the 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 the, the government not willing to do this. Now, also, <clears throat> excuse me, I did a little bit of math while you were talking there, and you said over 150 years, there's about 3,200 deaths. That's just over 20 a year, um, which, again, today we are used to no kids dying. You know. Uh, all of us have had stories who have children or have friends with children where their kid, like, you know, gets in an accident and needs emergency surgery or something, and they miraculously live. They would not have lived 50, 100, 50 60, 70, 80 years ago. In some cases, 30 or 40 years ago, depending on the surgery availability. Also, the more uh, rural you are, the less opportunity you have for getting emergency access care. Where I live, we have a, a hospital 15 minutes away, but it's a small country hospital. If we want to go to a big city, it's an hour, hour and a half, two hours. And that's, you know, that can, that can make a difference. Um, also, <clears throat> um, whatever one's opinion may be about vaccines or immunizations in general, um, there were various plagues and epidemics that did pass through the population that would get European kids, native kids, didn't matter who. Uh, you know, the Spanish flu did not discriminate based on skin color, for example. Um, so anyway, there, these, these are these are tuber- these are things tuberculosis, tuberculosis. Yeah, that get it. I mean, it still gets people in, in some parts of the world today. Um, and so, I mean, twenty one kids a year. We've got a hundred schools or so going on at a time. I mean, these are this is every child matters, as the expression goes. The the, the, the Marxists love to tell us today, except the children in the womb, in their opinion. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, I'm sure, and you can probably do this for us because you have the research. If you were to look at out of a hundred public schools across, you know, three provinces, which is regular public schools, you might find 20 kids die in the year 1907. Um, you might find more. I mean, these are just sadly what happens in a previous time where medical care was not the same as it is now. Well, that, that's very relevant. And actually, let's look at this. As of, as of November 2014, the Commission, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, identified 2,040 students in the name register. They, he divi- they divided the register as name register for the period between 1867 to 2000. That's basically 133 years. And then combined, uh, when combined with the figures in the unnamed register, because a lot of um, uh, registers, a lot of students' names uh, did not be in any register in the 19th century or 10 of the 20th century, the total of deaths of children is 3,201. So you were very close, it's 24 deaths average per year. If we divide the total number of deaths by 133 years. So the majority of deaths took place prior 1940, which is not surprising because there was a lot of cases of tuberculosis, accidents, as you pointed out, but especially natural diseases. And then in the, after the 40s and especially 50s, the deaths go down dramatically because of medication, um, tuberculosis were, was able to be treated because and before the 50s, there was no treatment for tuberculosis. And in the post-1940 period, there were 44 death reports that do not provide the student's name um, out of 100 and 691 deaths. Uh, from 1940 to 2000. So we're talking about 11, after after the 40s, we're talking about 11.51 deaths average per year. Now, compared to how many children, we're going, we can talk about this, how many children die in the average population in Canada today, is, uh, is com- you can compare that, that figure. And uh, the number of students, uh, student deaths per year rose during the early years of the residential systems operation in the, in the 19th century. It was very much the same in the rest of Canada and in Europe. And it declined in the second decade of the 20th century, um, only to rise again. This is according to the, the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission. And uh, then they, also the report, they say, they, they found the documented location where residential school deaths took place between 1867 and the year 2000. So in the school, how many children died in the school? It was in, 
more or less 150 years. Um, 832 in hospital, 427 in a sanatorium, because before there was any treatment for tuberculosis, uh, people were sent to a sanatorium. Um, there were 43, and at home, 418 children died at home. And outside the, in other place, 90. So uh, some of them died being exposed to maybe the, if they had run away or they were, um, they were having a picnic. There were some instances that I came across when the children where they were having a, a, a day out and they died, they were drowning. And so in total, there were 90 of them. And um, now this is interesting. In 32 of the 832 cases, uh, reported deaths at the school, and I quote, the location was identified also as occurring in the school infirmary. So we are talking about schools with infirmaries. Uh, they had nurses and then they, some of the sisters, the religious sisters, were, they, they were looking after these children. Uh, and actually in some of the archives, the diaries that they kept for the mother houses, they talk about um, so at times they had missiles, they had um, epidemics of missiles, tuberculosis, the flu. Um, more, on many occasions, even the staff um, were affected by that and the difficulties, even especially when the, some of the children came back from the holidays and uh, they, they came back, especially before sanitation, with terrible diseases and infections, and then the, 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 uh, the, the schools were taking care of them. And uh, depending on the period in which the student death occurred, a hospital, quote unquote, a hospital death could have uh, taken place in a church-run mission hospital, or it could have been a, an Indian Affairs hospital, or a hospital operated for the general public. And now the causes of death, this is uh, um, very, very uh, pertinent, because as I pointed out, um, tuberculosis was rampant, and uh, there is usually a report by a famous doctor, Dr. Bryce, uh, B-R-Y-C-E, uh, employed by the federal government uh, because, uh, and he wasn't the first one, there were uh, reports and physicians sent to inspect the, the, the facilities, the, in this case, the residential schools. And he reported in 1907, he's, he said in his report, our industrial and boarding schools, again, something I said at the beginning, there were industrial schools, boarding schools, and also day schools at one point. And he said, have been for the full term of residence in them, the home of the child, and for his health, the staff of the school is immediately responsible. This fact has been recognized by the government, which has for many years appointed and paid medical officers for supervising the health of the children. This is important because at times we have the image that these children were left to their own resources. And not only they had the, the staff, the adults, looking after them and the infirmaries, but also they were physicians paid by the government to inspect and to make sure that the there was uh, a quality. And some of these reports, they said, they came with infections, especially tuberculosis from the homes. And at times the conditions, when you're talking about the 19th century or 10th of the 20th century, the, the facilities were not excellent. But having said that, in Canloops, I was looking at the, the principal, one of the uh, letters, he, he writes to the government asking for funding to introduce the refrigeration system first the electricity in it was 1920 21 uh, to have the um, electricity installed in the can loops residential school and the following year the refrigeration refrigeration system for the when they had to kill the animals to provide food for the for the for the children uh, to have the refrigeration system and then uh, other schools, bit by bit, they introduce showers and running water. So that's cru crucial because at that time, uh, in other uh, uh, tr uh, tribal uh, communities, obviously they didn't have running water. And that was one of the challenges. When they came back uh, to the school, they hadn't had a, a bath for months and they came with either head lice, which is one of the reasons why when uh, the children had to go to school, the same in, in Europe, they, they had to be delized because there was no treatment for, uh, for, for that. Now, um, when it comes to the... Here, the let, reason, me, so let me just jump in though too, because we're talking about them getting electricity and running water in the 20s and 30s. I know people who moved to Canada 
in the 40s and 50s into northern Alberta and did not have electricity. And they didn't have toilets either. One person told me a story how uh, this guy's probably in his 70s now. His wife, when she was a child, they, had a, they were from England. They had a farm in northern Alberta, which was given to them by the government because it was a program for bringing farmers over. And if she had to go to the washroom at night, this is a little gross, but in order to pee in the bucket for not to splash back at her, she would have to tap the top of the ice, which was somebody else's urine, to go to the washroom. And this was in Canada, the first world country, 60, 70 years ago. Uh, they clearly didn't have running water or electricity. This was not because the government hated them or because they wanted them to die or blah, 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 blah. This is because Canada is a very young country. A lot of it's very harsh climate. Infrastructure takes a long time. Now we're known for good infrastructure, Canada, because I think necessity, the mother of all invention, we do have some of the best telecom and things like that in the world, I think, because we have to. Um, uh, but that's not always been the case. Also, people... Um, if we were to look at the average death rate out off the reserves, I bet you it's higher than the schools. I would just, I would probably say, uh, you read some of these stories about the conditions because, you know, um, you have to understand the existence for many Native Canadians was very moribund, meaning it was very poor, very malnourished. Uh, there was lots of uh, con congenital diseases and things like that because, I mean, again, Everyone here goes to university and they read about these residential schools from a Marxist perspective. And when they have a, a sniffles, they go and get their seventh booster and they get their Advil and they have their nice showers and they have their AirPods and they have their iPhones and they think, wow, this is terrible. How could they live like that? But you don't realize everybody lived like that. If you did not live in what we call civilization, you could call it colonial, you could call it Christocentric or whatever Eurocentric you want. Civilization, where you have roads, where you have homes, where you have heating, where you have electricity, where you have medical care. If you don't have that, you will not live in a Rousseauian Pocahontas fantasy. You will be, you read, the, you read I was reading the other day for um, the Canadian Martyrs Feast Day, right? Isaac Jogue and Jean de Brebeuf, they're writing to some of their uh, priests to come from France. And he, he says, you know, you know, basically, you're probably going to die. Uh, you're not going to sleep when you get here because you're going to have fleas bouncing around you. Um, the food is really bad. By the way, the priests had good dwellings compared to a lot of the people because they brought their technologies from it, from Europe. And uh, in some cases, you will get tomahawked to death if the person you're talking to has a bad opinion of you. The, the, this is, that was the situation for most Native Canadians in the hinterlands, which is where these schools were largely, until like 120, 130 years ago. People don't understand. Uh, in the 1800s, 1840s, 50s, 60s, there are parts of Canada where First Nations people uh, have been living the same way since a thousand years prior. And anyway, th yes, these are just the historical context is, is so important for this because if you don't understand it, it won't put it in perspective. Well, that's a very important point. Even the, the, the report from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Volume 4, page 30, they state tuberculosis was the dominant reported cause of death. It was identified as a contributing cause of death in 896 instances, approximately. It's a third of the total number of deaths. And then they say in 737 of those instances, it was the sole cause of death, tuberculosis. And it was the reported cause of death in 48.7% of the cases for which there is a reported cause of death. So the, almost the, but this is important because in the 1920s, the government, the provincial government of Saskatchewan conducted the first survey of tuberculosis among school uh, students uh, of the, the, the general population. And they said that half of them had tuberculosis. That was before the 50s. That was in the 1920s, right? So half. So when we're talking about the Indian population and the, the, the rest of the population, the school population, it was very much the same, right? Because again, um, tuberculosis and influenza or pneumonia doesn't discriminate, didn't discriminate, and it doesn't discriminate whether you are rich or poor. Um, the other two major causes of death were influenza and pneumonia, about 360 cases of deaths in total. And then the influenza, something that you mentioned, uh, the influenza pandemic in, of 1918 caused a spike in the residential school of influenza death rates. And this is 
relevant because I came across the, the report from uh, Father Allard, the principal of uh, at Fort St. James, like Kamloops, also in the same region of British Columbia. And Father Allard described in his diary they were forced to undertake, due to the Spanish influenza of uh, 1918, uh, the, the pandemic uh, that decimated the staff, uh, the student body and the community of the mission, uh, affecting the ability of the school staff sick with the ravages of influenza to provide individual burials, according to Father Allard's report, they had to provide individual burials, having to resort to, quote, a large common grave, as he put it. Here is the, the example of, the, of those massive graves that we, you, you mentioned at the beginning. Uh, in this particular case, Father Lars said, because everybody was sick, the, uh, the school staff was sick, and, uh, and they couldn't provide the burial for, for the, the, the children, so they had to resort to a large common grave. Um, so of the, the students, around 180 students died of pneumonia, we have the records, 100 of them died due to lung disease, around 90 of them died due to meningitis, and heart disease caused about 50 deaths, and whooping cough, almost 40, and typhoid, typhoid fever, about 30 of them, of the students, of the pupils, and hemorrhage, 30, and other deaths were caused in small numbers by intestinal disease, kidney disease, appendicitis, brain disease, liver disease, and also unknown illness and multiple causes. For example, one girl, I, I saw the records of one girl who died when a piece of ice fell off the roof of a Catholic Indian residential school while playing outside. And this is attested by the principal's report, the Indian agency inquiry report, and the physician's official statements. So here's an example of one girl who is playing outside and then she died. Just a, a nice fell on, on the, from the roof. So you know, ladies and gentlemen, all of these deaths are sad. Okay, no, we're no, no one here is saying this isn't a big deal. But what we're saying is, none of this is the fault of the church. None of this is the, nothing. None of this is really even the fault of the government. As much as I like to blame the government for all my problems, like every Canadian does, unless unless you like the one who's in power. Um, uh, this is this is life, you know. Like these are disease. Th this is very sad. These these facts are very sad. It's it, you know you think about, you know, I have soon to be six children. If one of my children were to die of a flu, or or tuberculosis, I mean, this is very very sad. And people used to die all the time. You know, I have a one of my uncles. I'll never meet because he died when he was eight weeks old or something like that. You know, in 1945 or something. You know, um, children, infants, young people, they died because they did not have the care. You know, I have friends right now with their poor little girls being admitted to the hospital um, for some crazy virus thing, and she'll be fine. She'll survive. But you know what? She might not have survived eight, 100 years ago. Um, and this was life. And you have to just use your reasoning here, especially if you're someone who stumbled upon this episode and you're not a conservative, you're not a Catholic, you're not somebody who's already okay with hearing this. Listen, go do a survey of all the different names of all those hospitals and all those major cities in Canada. I guarantee you they're going to be called things like St. Joseph's or St. Mary's or Corpus Christi or whatever. And why is that? Because the Catholic Church has always been at the forefront of caring for the sick. Do people really think that the Catholic Church, and, and, and maybe we can talk a little bit about the claims of abuse, which are more complicated, um, but nonetheless, do we really think that many of these teachers and nuns and, and, and priests and things, many of them were very much saints, you know, they, they left Europe, they got on a boat to come over 150 years ago, the chance they're going to die from plague or scurvy. And they say, you know what, I'm going to go to the northern Manitoba, and I'm going to go and uh, teach children how to read. Why would anyone do that if they hated the children? It doesn't make, it's the arguments against the residential schools, the arguments saying the church was monstrous. Again, there are sinners in the church. Judas was one of the 12 apostles. Christ gives us his example. There will always be sinners. As long as you or I are part of the Catholic Church, bad people will be part of the Catholic Church, okay? But, but these, pe these people, they psych it's psychologically impossible to say that there was an intention to harm these children. They love these children. They love them like their own children. They were nuns. Nuns love kids. <laughs> That's what they, anyway, I'm going a little tangent here, but this has to be understood. Yeah, in their records, in the archives, in the diaries, 
the the sisters they talk about our children the the care they they provide for them um even the, not only just with the structure the education lots of these nuns came from either from france from quebec from belgium the mother tongue was french and because um the, the the church saw that maybe the instruction in english was going to help the aboriginal children to um, benefit from participating in society these nuns had to learn english to provide english instruction even though the mother tongue was french and we're talking about the turn of the 20th century that is learning the language is always a challenge and also they provided meals they provided a, a home um, and this is a, if anybody's interested in watching the documentary, uh, a beautiful documentary, um, black and white, uh, produced in the 60s by the CDC, and it's called The Eyes of Children, Life at a Residential School, The Eyes of Children, and it's beautiful, and it shows can looks uh, preparing uh, the children and the staff preparing for Christmas, and the instruction, the games, the dances, the singing, the the Christmas play, um, and the care, and uh, they finish, and also even getting ready to go to bed, praying, uh, washing the, the hair, and uh, the, the, you see the classrooms, how tidy, how uh, the, how well organized everything is, and at the end they finish the documentary. One of the the girls saying that she would like to be a nun to bring basically Christ to to the world to other people beautiful it was made in the 60s and actually the one of the nuns uh, portrayed in that in the documentary it's a, it's a documentary it's basically the cameraman following this the the staff and the children and some of the staff also a percentage of the staff in these residential schools were also uh, indigenous they were aboriginals and some of them went back to the schools to get married uh, there is there are two resources that i will invite you to to access to one it was called indian report for decades it was a publication published in canada mainly in winnipeg by the oblates about documentation documenting um the work they did with the the aboriginals uh, especially in the schools and um, being the voice for the aboriginals lobbying the government to improve the conditions and they did that for decades and it's called the indian report and uh, also I mentioned the document, um, the, doc uh, the, the program from the BBC in the 60s. And uh, also uh, another great resource is a researcher. She has done a fabulous, a fantastic uh, work. Nina Green, uh, N-I-N-A Green, Nina Green. Uh, if you type Nina Green residential schools, she has done a fabulous and uh, outstanding work uh, documenting, looking at the archives and the diaries of the, the religious sisters and church documents and the oblates in the 1970s provide all the archives to the government of alberta and these uh, resources are freely available anybody can you can for example go to quebec you can search the archives of the oblates and everything is documented this in that respect is is fantastic now in terms of the deaths if you compare for example the number of suicides uh, this is another figure out of the estimated 150,000 aboriginal pupils in 130 years of education, there were only six suicides. Now, how does it compare to today? Bec well, well, to compare this figure with today's Canada, in 2015, there were 140 male suicides between the age of 15 and 19. So that means 14 per 100,000 suicide rate, whereas before it was much less, right? And, uh, and also, uh, there were no the Truth and Reconciliation Commission reports. They they haven't been able to document a single case of homicide. So in 130 years of education, not a single student, not a single pupil was killed at the hands of uh, of the staff, as we have made to believe by I don't know by some people. And, uh, for example, now there is a problem in the school system of uh, over drug overdoses and children being killed by, by other children with a knife or even a, a gun. Nothing of that happened in, under the care of the residential school system. So, in total, throughout almost a century and a half of residential schools, Indian schools, there were 57 drownings, also the cause of death, when children drown, um, 40 deaths in the school fires, uh, obviously 
uh, it was a current occurrence, not only in the schools, but in any building. 20 deaths uh, took place due to exposure to the elements, the cold weather, and 38 died from a variety of other accidents, including vehicle accidents and even faults, and 33 pupils perished um, being truants when they, they were running away from uh, the school for a variety of causes. And actually some of the nuns, some of the religious sisters, they documented that in the diaries, some of the, some of the children were getting bored, others, they, it was at the end of the school year, they wanted to go back home. And in most cases, the parents, when they had parents, because some of the children had been brought up by not the parents, but the parents had abandoned them, and some of them didn't have, they were orphans, they didn't have anybody in this world. And then the principals, they, they reported that we had to take these children because they didn't have a single soul in this world to look after them. Um, so that's, that's the truth about the, the, the deaths of, of this, um, of this uh, the students. Everything is being documented. And again, the Truth and Reconciliation Report, um, they, they, they say that. They're not, uh, even they talk about the pneumonia death rate. Um, pneumonia, for example, had a number of spikes before undergoing a significant decline in the 1940s, as you might expect. And tuberculosis, as I mentioned earlier, the tuberculosis death rate was dramatically higher than the influenza and pneumonia death rates until the second decade of the 20th century. But it, not only in the school system, in the residential Indian, Indian residential schools, but also for the, the, the rest of the population. Um, the Canadian Public Health Association, just to put things in context, pointed out that in 1867, tuberculosis was the leading cause of death in Canada. And the bacterium that causes TB, tuberculosis, was discovered by a German scientist, um, Dr. Robert Koch, in 1882. And during this time, according to the Canadian Public Health Association, TB killed one out of every seven people living in the United States and in Europe. So when we talk about all the deaths, in this case of Indians in the school system because of tuberculosis, think about the rest of the, the impact of TB in the rest of the population, right? One out of every seven people. And the, the same, um, the in compar for comparison's sake, the American Lung Association says in the website that at the turn of the 20th century, tuberculosis was the leading cause of death in the United States, right? Um, and according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, in 2013, there were 1.5 million TB-related deaths in the world. So TB is still a major cause of deaths around the world. Even in South Africa, in South Africa, according to statistics, South Africa, they reported in, in 2016 that tuberculosis was the country's leading underlying natural cause of death in 2016. Unbelievable, but it's still the case, right? And uh, even in Canada, in Canada, according to the government of Canada, in 2017, there were 1,796 cases of active tuberculosis reported in Canada. Um, and some of them among the Canadian-born indigenous people, 21.5% uh, per 100,000 population, whereas in the rest of the Canadian population is 4.9 per 100,000 population. So you can see when you put things in context, uh, you have a better understanding of history. I usually say that we cannot uh, we cannot change history. That's why uh, that's the role of historians. It's a joke. It's a joke. No, that's not that's not a joke. That's true. It's also the role <laughs> of the government. Now, um, so I think we firmly established. Listen again. If if someone just hates the church, if somebody just thinks, if someone believes in the teaching of Jean Jacques Rousseau. And that every person, if they were just left alone and they never had any civilization, they would be perfect, wonderful, heroic, Pocahontas fantasies. If that's what you believe, well, first of all, stop using the internet and stop contributing to civilization and stop using language and stop eating food from a farm and just go and live in the woods because you should be consistent with your logic. Um, but it's kind of like people, when the people talk about overpopulation as being a problem, I, I rarely see them volunteering to bring down the population themselves. They always want somebody else to do it. It's kind of curious how that happens. Um, but when it comes to this, again, if someone hates the church, hates civilization, there's nothing we could say. Nothing we could say. But if somebody is reasonable and they say, hey, there's history, there's contact between human beings, there's attempts by the church, by the government, whoever, 
uh, to try to make the situation better. And within these, we have the natural inequalities of life. We have the natural, uh, you know, human beings live in a constant back and forth with nature and nature gets us at at some point. Okay, we're all going to die. Something's going to get us. So um, let's, we have about maybe, maybe 15 minutes left. Yeah, Perhaps. I can talk about oh, the sorry. burial policies and practices um, okay. because it, it, this is something that very few people know about. So when it comes to the burial policies and practices, the burial of a pupil of the residential school cemetery was free of charge for the child's parents. And if the parents or guardians were unable to pay for the funeral expenses of a child who died away from the residential school, the Department of Indian Affairs paid for it. And in the 1940s, Indian Affairs was prepared, the Department of Indian Affairs was prepared to cover the burial costs of residential school pupils who died in hospital. And the department's policy was for the body of a pupil who died at the school to be sent home, quote, when the parents have refused to permit burial at the school. So when the pupil was buried in the school was obviously with the understanding that the parents agreed to that. And also Indian Affairs stipulated, and I quote, ordinarily the body will be returned to the reserve, the Indian reserve, for burial only when transportation, embalming costs, and all the other expenses are borne by next of kin. Transportation may be authorized, however, in cases where the cost of burial on the reserve, the Indian reserve, is sufficiently low to make transportation economically advantageous, end of quote. This is relevant because then we can understand, again, um, especially when you're talking about the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, if you send a body, uh, it had to be in bomb, and then how you are going to transport it. And the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, in the report, they wrote, and I quote, at some point in the early 20th century, Indian Affairs formalized its policy on the burial of the students who died at residential schools. The policy is recorded in an undated memorandum by J.D. McLean, who, has, who was the Departmental Secretary from 1897 to 1933. According to McLean, and I quote, funeral expenses are met from relief vote. Vote meaning the money set aside for welfare-related expenses. If a pupil of an Indian residential school dies elsewhere than at the school, and provided the parents and guardians all guardians are unable to pay the cost of the burial. When a pupil dies at a residential school, it is considered by this department that the school authorities should be responsible for the expenses. Occasionally, the department has paid the cost of transporting the body from the school to the home of the parents when the parents have refused to permit burial at the school. The practice was to keep burial costs low. low uh, end of quote. And then the commission report says, given that the schools were virtually all church run in the early years of the system, Christian burial was the norm at most schools. Many of the early schools were part of a larger church mission centers that might include a church, a dwelling for the missionaries, a farm, possibly a sawmill and a cemetery. The church was intended to serve as a place of worship for both residential school students and adults from the surrounding region, and in the same way, the cemetery might serve as a place of burial for students who died at the school, members of the local community, and the missionaries themselves. For example, the cemetery at the Roman Catholic St. Mary's Mission near Mission, the same region as St. Eugene Mission in Canloops Residential School in British Columbia, was intended originally for priests and nuns for, from the mission, as well as for students from the residential school. Three oblate bishops were buried there along with settlers, their descendants, and residential school students." End of quote. And this is from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report. So the, the report, the Truth and Reconciliation, they know about the type of area, how it was conducted, and, uh, and everything is documented. That's the beauty, the beauty of this. Um, you know, um, I think you're one of the only people who's probably ever investigated the Truth and Reconciliation Commission because I spoke with um, a gentleman. He runs, he's one of the people who runs the Frontier Policy Institute. It is one of the, it's probably the best conservative think tank in Canada. Um, for a long time, they did have the ear of former Prime Minister Harper. 
um, and I spoke with this gentleman, and um, you know, he said the, the the TRC, the Truth Reconciliation Commission report, is about four thousand pages, whatever it is. Um, it's not what people think it is. It's not. It's not like a court document that's like evidence or something. It's more of just like findings that are kind of put into categories. So he said, for example, maybe this can segue into the next thing I want to ask you before we finish up here. He said, first of all, and they have on their on the Frontier Policy Institute, they do have a former Superior Court judge uh, who does do stuff for them. So he's pretty reputable in his reputation. And uh, he said, no one in government has read the TRC report. Like nobody in parliament. They all just rely on their back, you know, their, uh, you know, their assistance and things like that. Nobody's read it. No one's <laughs> opened it up and said, I'm going to read 4,000 pages. Because he said, the thing about the TRC report is it's a record of just information. So he says, sometimes there will be multiple claims of the same thing. So, you know, multiple people will, will talk about, <laughs> attest, attest to the same event having happened. So let's just say, because I want to I ask a question here about more of the, the abuse side of things, which is more sensitive. But even there, it's not as simple as people think it is. Um, He'll say, he said, for example, you know, so-and-so, whether it's true or not, goes home, says they were abused at school by a teacher, by a religious, by a f- other student. It's, it, you know, it could happen. Um, they tell 10 people and then they interview these people as part of the TRC report. There are 10 claims of abuse. This counts as 10 abuse claims if people understand the math here. And these things are not, they, there's no distinctions made about the information. So maybe you can speak to the, the, the claims of abuse in the TRC in a general sense. And people need to have this critical eyes. Well, we're not, we're not denying anyone's trauma, no one's, but, but we're just saying, like, again, we're dealing with human history. Human history is complicated. There are good people, there are bad people, and most people are in between. And, and good people do bad things, and even bad people do good things. And, and this is just an example of that. So maybe we can talk about that for a bit. Well, when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was set up, and they even say that this is not to be a court um, and we don't have the authority to cross-examine um, any claim. So there were two things. First of all, they said, we are just going to provide a forum where people can say whatever they like to say uh, for 15 minutes. And for many years, actually, it was recorded, there was a, a TV channel, the CPAC in Canada, it's called the CPAC, the political channel when they were broadcasting uh, some of these um, accounts or testimonies of many people who went to re- residential schools and then they were free to, to express whatever they wanted to express. Because first of all, as I said, the commission said, this is not, we're not going to cross-examine. So we're not going to attest the veracity of these uh, statements because it wasn't a court case. But I listened to uh, countless hours of these testimonies, and what is uh, striking is many, many of those testimonies they were saying how grateful they were to the education and the environment provided by the, in the residential schools. uh, An example that comes to mind that is also become quite uh, well known is uh, a famous author and musician, uh, indigenous called Tom, Tom uh, Highway, and he was being interviewed by this uh, political channel, uh, CPAC, and he was saying how grateful he was to what he learned um, at the residential school, because he said, I learned not only the the English language, but also music, and they provided with a good environment. He's not the only one. When I was listening to the testimonies of the residential, of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, many of them said, uh, they were very grateful. They were provided with things that at home they were not provided with. Even when you look at the, the reports of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, they had selected only certain passages, very, very few passages, and they left out uh, the other passages when, when I was listening to them and they were saying how grateful they were. And also they were giving a, a picture of how horrible in m- many instances the living conditions were at home. They were saying, yes, I was being abused by my uncle or my father, and then being in the school provided that uh, life jacket, this safe environment. Or, for example, at school, uh, at home, they didn't have any education whatsoever. There was no access to any instruction whatsoever, and then being at school. I know quite a few Aboriginal students, and they attest to that, and I asked them. Uh, you went to, for example, uh, Sandy Bay, one of the residential schools here. 
and said, what was it like? And she was saying, we're grateful because they were provided with not only the education, with access to access to sports, entertainment, cinema, meals. And I was saying to this lady I know, Aboriginal, I said, is it true that they were providing you every day for free, three meals a day? They said, no, it's not true. It was four, four meals a day. And then also access to uh, a safe environment from their perspective. So, and the other thing that I would ask, ask uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that they were actually, they neglected and, uh, and it was only one sided. They didn't consult the archives and the annals of the religious uh, institutes, the religious organizations that they documented the, with the archives and as I said, archives and uh, diaries of these, of thousands of religious and they would have incorporated that in the report. They didn't. And the question I would ask them is why they neglected that. So yeah, this let's 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 break down some of those. Uh, let's break that down for a second. Also, I was thinking as you were saying this. So the the TRC Commission report, the TRC report came out in 2014, right? Was it 2014 or 15? 15. I'm 15. I remember watching the um, live. Um, Re- release of it. It's funny. I remember one of the indigenous gentlemen, he thanked John Paul, Pope John Paul II during his thing. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report comes out around 2014, 2015. <clears throat> that means there's about 10 years of research before that. So let's just do some um, numbers here. They were no longer run by the churches by the end of the 1960s. Uh, they were elementary school students for the most part. So that means the um, basically, if you were not <clears throat> born in 1954 or before, basically, um, you were not going to go to a school run by the churches. So by the time 2005, <clears throat> uh, 2010 comes around, the only people around who went to the schools when they were run by the churches by that time are in their 70s and 80s. And that's the youngest ones available. You know, my father is 72, 73, born 1951. You know, his generation would have uh, been the last cohort where they could have, and again, think of people die and how many are left. It's a very small percentage of people who are testifying could have actually gone to the schools when they're run by the nuns. So even if you were to find, let's say, a lot of negative testimony, the vast majority of people who would have gone to these schools would have been attending these schools when the churches stopped running them. But even there we find that the testimony is largely positive. You know, again, I'm, 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 I am, I'm no fan of our government as it stands today. I mean, there are many problems with the Canadian government. But this country... It's not a country based on, you know, unadulterated hatred or bigotry or whatever any epithet you want to throw at it. Canada is a country. I'm very proud of the history of our country. I love my country. I'm a very strong patriot. I hate what's happened to it, but that's because I love what it's been. And I'm not going to say everything that any government official did in the past was perfect. As a Catholic, I have problems with the Freemasonic, Freemasonry background of some of our founders and things. I'm not going to apologize for that, do 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 apologetics for that. But I look at the general decency of the British tradition. Um, This was a wonderful, and the French history in Quebec, this is a wonderful country with a wonderful history with people who care, good people. Canadians have always been known for being friendly and generous, which has always historically been true. This is reflected in the treatment of all peoples in this country, always. And if you find bad apples, is the exception, not the rule. Well, and I think that's a good point, because when you look at the history of Canada, and there were no massacres of um, at the hands of the Canadians, uh, massacres of Aboriginals, unlike in other through history in other parts of the world. Having said that, when we talk about the Canadian martyrs, for example, the North American martyrs, when they documented all those Jesuits and even um, other Indians killing other Indians, um, well, they usually we usually forget about that. Um, but in, the, the fact that they were, in this case, with the, the school system, um, and even to this day, 
there were thousands of people and religious priests, religious sisters, brothers, um, lay people who, as you pointed out, especially in the 19th century, 10th of the 20th century, who sacrificed their, their lives uh, for the betterment of um, thy neighbor. Um, and you, when you look at com in comparison, I usually say, okay, what was the, what was the student like, the student population like, or the student system like in France or in Italy or in Portugal in the 19th century or in England? And uh, what was the, what was the standards? When you look at the reports of the, the school inspectors, when they were going to the different schools, they reported on the, the date the, the, the visit uh, took place, the name of the um, of the teacher. Uh, the, uh, the qualifications, how many st uh, students were in the class uh, that day, uh, how many were re uh, enrolled, how many were missing the, the class, the state of the furniture, the state of the books, the quality of the teaching. And that was constant throughout um, until the end. Now, when, when it comes to the, the Aboriginals in the 60s, I came across the archives of uh, some of the, the, the sisters saying that in the 60s, the government already wanted to take over the, one of the schools um, and they wanted to send the indigenous, the Indi Indian children to the day school and the parents objected to that. And then as a protest, they didn't send the, the children to, to the school for uh, at least a week until the Indian agent um, made some adjustments because the parents wanted their children to be sent to the residential school because the quality and the conditions were better than just going to the day school and they would have finished obviously in the day school going back home and they preferred them to to be sent and actually we have the records of many instances when the the chief of the council of the indian council they were requesting the government to provide the to build the schools and specifically at times catholic schools to provide for the for the education of the children that is the truth and um I'm, and if somebody doesn't want to to know about that, that well, that's uh, there's nothing we can do about it. But the records are there. That's the yeah. beauty of this. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, to conclude here, listen, this is very different. And I hope I hope if you have a family member or a friend, you know, if you watch my show, you know, I've actually probably been a lot less polemical than I usually am, which is saying a lot. Um, because, you know, I know people of goodwill. You know, the other day I was at a fair. <clears throat> Excuse me, with my kids, and it was like the orange, the orange shirt day. It was the twenty, the thirtieth, and the, you know it wasn't that many people, but some people were wearing these shirts. And a lot of these people, I'm sure they're just really nice people, and they've been told the Canadian government, the various Christian churches, they used to do really bad stuff, and they wanted to kill the native kids and whatever. And they put on this shirt, this orange shirt. If you're American, people wear these orange shirts on September thirtieth, um, about Truth and Reconciliation Day or whatever, and. You know, there's people, the odd person has one of those Every Child Matter flag, um, you know, hanging from their flagpole or whatever. And I'm sure these people are of goodwill. I'm sure these people care about kids. I mean, I would, most of them are probably liberal and are probably pro-choice. There's kind of a contradiction there. But nonetheless, I think most people, generally speaking, are neither black and white, bad, good or bad. I think it's usually a mix. Like all of us, <clears throat> our, the human heart is, is full of flaws and iniquity. And we all do our best to try to do good things to those around us. And, and if we believe in God, to do right by God. And I think that's the same for people who wear the orange shirts, as much as I think the orange shirt phenomenon is silly. Well, the, orange, yeah. the orange shirt has been politicized and weaponized, as yeah. we usually say nowadays. Uh, the researcher Nina Green talks about the origin of that. And it was a former student. Uh, her name was Phyllis. Oh. Is Phyllis, she's still alive. And she went just for one year to a day school. It wasn't even a residential school. And then she was being interviewed and she said, well, uh, she was brought up by uh, the grandmother because the parents abandoned her. So she didn't have the parents. And then she had the, somebody bought a shirt for her orange shirt. And when she went to school, basically she was asked to, to remove it because probably they, she, was, would have, she would have been given other clothes. We don't know the condition of those clothes when you have been, you, maybe you, you have been wearing the same thing for a long time. We don't know the condition and, um, of, that, um, of that piece of clothing. Uh, but then uh, she, in another interview, she talks about very highly of the teacher 
and the, the school the the school year she spent uh, in the day school so she didn't have anything bad to to say but then this idea of the orange shirt has been weaponized uh, which is perfectly understandable as part of this uh, cultural marxist ideology and this is something that uh, solarinsky talked about in his rules for radicals how to weaponize this to to create momentum um, yeah it's the same thing listen you know it's same thing with black lives matter you know it's the people who run black lives matter are living in mansions and things like that but it's all about empowering the ghetto ghetto residents and things like that but it's not it's not and this is the same thing and people you've got to just listen you can hate the church all you want i i don't think you should but if you do that's your choice you know whatever um and but you've got to reconcile with what's actually happened and what's actually happened well, is sorry go on and there are two questions there are two questions that we always ask okay in, intrinsically speaking, uh, what's the value of education? Is good or bad when you have an, an education? And even when you compare, for example, talking about residential schools, what courses were taught 40, 50, 60 years ago and the courses being taught now, uh, how does it differ? Differ, And also, do you want your children to be in Canada to be taught English and French or English or French? Um, do you want them to, to do well, to do better? And also, since when, for example, something I usually ask uh, people I talk to, uh, tell me something that the church teaches that objectively is harmful for you in terms of the doctrine. And again, education, is it objectively, we are the result of education, and we had teachers, some of them were better than others, but all, all in all, when you say objectively speaking, is education good or bad for you? And then somebody cares, provides the, a, trying to provide a good environment, well, then you can you can answer that. Well, and you know, again, you know, people out there, if you if you think you're doing the right thing by jumping on the narrative, and you think it's going to stop with that, oh, you know, that was that was the bad part, but everything else was good, or or you know, it's not going to like when you when you bend the knee to the cultural Marxists, they will make you go on the other knee, and then they'll make you bow your head, and then they'll cut your head off. This is what they do. Uh, when Pope Francis came and did his apology tour. All of the leaders were saying that apology wasn't good enough. All of the, you know, indigenous people were saying, well, I wish he would have been stronger on this or that. I mean, he literally sat through a non-Catholic religious ceremony, which is basically pagan. And that's not enough. That's never enough when you, it's never enough for the cultural Marxist. So if you think you're doing the right thing, and this is why, you know, Pierre Polyev, our conservative leader and stuff, he's good on some things, but he, he drinks the Kool-Aid on the, I mean, he'll at least say, don't burn churches. And he'll probably, if asked, say that there were no mass graves, he can stomach that. But I'm sure in the next breath, he'll say, but we must do justice for all of the ethnic cleansing. He'll say something, something like that. And it will, it is, it is never enough. It's never enough. You will never satisfy the beast. Well, there's, you mentioned something, the churches that were burned, set on fire on purpose. There were dozens of them in Canada on Canadian soil. And nobody said anything against it. The media supported it, applauded it. Nobody challenged that. And this, this is absolutely shocking. Actually, having lived in Spain and in the UK and in Canada, I never come across so much um, hate against Catholics, not only just the Catholic Church, but Catholics in general. Than here, it, through the media, at times it's very subtle. In polite society, at times it could be just the odd comment, and at times openly, when you go to the online forums of newspapers, I'm thinking of uh, particular cases, the Winnipeg Free Press years ago, there was a Catholic principal who stood for a Catholic principles as a principal, uh, and um, the animosity, the, the animosity and the hate, the animus against Catholics, it was unbearable. It was shocking. It was really shocking. And at times you see article after article. If you just Google anything, just you go to the CBC or CTV or any newspaper in Canada and just Google something to do with the Catholic Church, the vast majority, more than 90% of the articles is going to be against Catholics or the Catholic Church, which is absolutely shocking. Oh, if, if, if this was happening, and again, we're not equivocating, I, I believe Catholicism is true, I believe other religions are false, but even, but from a, from a purely sociological perspective, from just observational perspective, if this was the way it was done about Muslims, the various in, indigenous group religions, 
Buddhists, whatever, they'd be passing a a unanimous uh, bill, both conservatives and liberal, through Parliament tomorrow, asking for an investigation into the racist uh, hate crimes against a particular religious group. Um, but with Catholicism, that's one of the reasons I know Catholicism is true, because the world hates it. And uh, if you are going to be a Christian, Christ says the world hated me first. Uh, so, you know, they can be, yeah, they don't like the evangelicals. They get a little uppity with their pro-marriage stuff, but they're okay with female ordination. They're okay with contraception, so we'll leave them alone. They don't have sacraments. They're not really going to, you know, I know there's individuals that are really pr- principled, but as, as organizations, they'll, they'll, you know, they leave, they don't, they don't, they're not like the Catholics where they want to do things like build beautiful structures and, you know, civilization. They, they don't, they don't get into that like the Catholics do. So they they always come after us. Um, it's going to be interesting though. And I do have to run here in a couple minutes, but it's going to be interesting now that there's this big Muslim resurgence against the transgender stuff in Canada. It's going to be fascinating to see the liberals, their pet project has been these, you know, Syrians and things like that they've brought over and using them for political capital. But now they're revolting against their transgender agenda. It's going to be fascinating to see when their, uh, you know, their supposed puppets, uh, you know, get a personality of their own like Pinocchio and go after them. It's going to be fascinating to see. Yeah. All right. Jesus. You know, it's not very often that I get to do a virtual live stream with Jesus, uh, but I guess it is Jesus. It's not the same. Um, uh, in any case, please, at some point, uh, whenever you want to talk about anything, <clears throat> you've got a, an extensive background in research. Um, you know, you, you, you bring a sophisticated air to the conversation. It's not just this, this dab with webcam, so to speak. So please let me know whenever you'd like to come back to talk about anything that's historical, whatever to do with the Catholic faith or Canada. It's been wonderful. Um, last thing. You do run a sort of language institute. Why don't you tell us, let us know where people can go to find your work? Spanishinstitute.ca, uh, um, as in Canada, also Catholic, depends. Yeah. And I teach uh, online. Um, I have private students and do translations, interpretations, and also organize cultural events. And if anybody would like to invite me to talk about anything to do with it, our wonderful Catholic cultural capital, and tradition to Spanish or language learning or learning Spanish, go to Spanish, SpanishInstitute.ca, please. Excellent. And uh, good. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, as and always. And also there's another oh. website to do with this Catholic. There's a new YouTube, YouTube channel. It's Catholic Nomads. There is a, one of the parishioners is putting together a channel to talk about the Catholic cultural capital to do with traditions, and it's a Catholic Nomads on YouTube. Okay. You just, in an email, why don't you give me the links for these things and I'll make sure I put them in the show notes. Um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, as always, this is a doozy. I'm going to get some interesting comments here, but let me know what you think in the comments. I'll reply if it's nice. And if it's not nice, I'll just leave you alone. And uh, this has been the Kennedy Report. Till next time, God bless. Thank you, Jesus.